tonight we're diving into serine. Serine is a very important amino acid. You see it's a non-essential amino acid, meaning that our body can produce it, and it's got multiple roles. It was discovered and isolated in 1865 by Emil Kramer from silk protein, the Latin term sericum, uh, basically defining or establishing that name serine. Now, the body can make serine. Under certain conditions, however, deficiencies can occur. And we've learned a lot of this through genetic errors we'll talk about in a little minute. But when people have generalized malnutrition, they're not eating enough total protein calories, when they're under intense stress, this amino acid becomes what's known as conditionally essential under certain conditions. So our body can produce serine, but under conditions, our body needs to get more serine from the diet. And this is where supplementation or increased dietary intake may become necessary. If we look at some of the functions of serine, it really plays a central role in a lot of biochemistry. You see it plays a role in cell proliferation, so how cells grow and make new cells. It plays a major role in immune system function as well as nervous system function. If you ever heard this term phospholipid or sphingolipid, these are specialized fatty substances in the cell membranes of all of our cells, and they help with signaling as well as membrane fluidity so that the outer layer of your cell membrane um, gets its fluidity in part from these phospholipids, also extremely important in neurological tissue, hence there's overlap amongst these. Now, we also know that serine plays a major role in detoxification through its ability to help your body produce glutathione, the master antioxidant and detoxifier, and it aids in the methylation cycle. Predominantly, it helps with folate, which is vitamin B9. So these two play kind of an interconnecting role with each other. And for those of you who really enjoy the biochemistry, we'll dive in to a little bit of that here in just a second. So let's dive into some of the biochemistry of serine. If you, if you look at where it predominantly comes from, so one place that we can get serine in the diet is through consumption of protein. And there's a lot of foods, we'll go over those in a moment, of which foods contain the highest kind of amount of serine per volume. But we can also synthesize serine. And one of the ways we can make serine internally is having adequate glucose. So we can actually derive serine from glucose through, uh, through biochemical pathway. And then we also, through the breakdown of proteins and phospholipids, again, phospholipids are the structures that surround your cell membranes, the fatty membrane around your cells and, and organelles. Those degrade and break down, and we can recycle serine from those. And then we can also make serine from glycine. So there's an inner conversion. You can see this arrow here goes back and forth, up and down, meaning we can make glycine from serine and we can make serine from glycine. So if we look a little bit deeper at this, when we're taking glucose and we're making serine, this, this pathway here, as it unfolds, one of the, it's not on here, I'll show you this in a minute, but one of these requires vitamin B6, another one of these requires something called NAD. So in order for us to turn glucose into serine, you need B6, and then NAD is vitamin B3. So you can actually develop B3, B6 deficiencies that might lead to a poor production of serine from glucose. That is a possibility. We can also make serine, as I mentioned, from glycine. And in order to do that, requires 510 MTHF. What in the heck is that? That's methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is otherwise known as folate or vitamin B9. So our body will take methylated vitamin B9 and through this conversion here, through this genetic conversion, this enzymatic conversion, we will take that and we will make L-serine from L-glycine. So glycine also is an amino acid. So these two, what I said before, they're interchangeable. So we can get serine from glucose, from intake of dietary protein, from the breakdown of existing protein or the degradation of phospholipids, as well as from converting it 
from glycine. So dietary, when we, when we don't have enough dietary protein coming in, we can end up, so low protein diets would increase the risk for the development of serine based problems. But additionally, as I mentioned earlier, under certain conditions, predominantly those would be outside of just not eating adequate food. That would be infants and growing children require more. That's a condition. Motherhood or pregnancy is a condition where more serine is necessary. Um, so these are two special conditions where this many argue in the scientific community that serine becomes an essential um, amino acid during those time frames. Where we also really see it is if people are going through heavy detox, if there's a lot of issues environmentally, heavy metal poisoning or mold poisoning or other issues because of, of serine's role in detoxification. We'll talk about its role in detox here in just a minute. But So again, what I showed you earlier, we can take glucose and we can get to serine through a number of biochemical pathways and then we can go to glycine or we can make something called D-serine. Now notice this is L-serine, it has an L in front of it. And when you're talking about nutritional supplementation, it's the L-serine that you're gonna typically found, find in supplements, not the D-serine. Your body can make D-serine from L-serine here um, in, a, in a biochemical process. And it's the D-serine that's super important for, it acts as a neurotransmitter. So it acts as in a, in a big way in terms of memory and in terms of cognitive function. You can see up here, it's responsible for sphingolipids in the central nervous system, L-serine is. So these are the fats that surround your brain cells that help them function properly. L-serine also plays a role as an anti-inflammatory, okay, via its downregulation of microglia and astrocyte proliferation and activation. Microglia and astrocytes are special neurological cells that play a role in inflammation of the brain. And this is where serine is arguably being the most well-researched right now is in its role around what's called neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. These tangles that form in the brain as a result of inflammation. And researchers now, and a lot of animal studies are investigating its, its role in breaking these things down and preventing this from happening. But we also know that serine plays a role in something called mTOR signaling and this is actually one of those pathways that protects and preserves humans from accelerated aging and inflammation. Um, and so, but its role in metabolism and immune function are very, very important. So this is in part why serine is so important. If we look additionally here, more biochemistry for those of you who like it, you notice on this side, of the diagram, you've got several different things. Now, if you look at, at these are amino acids, we look at the serine is in orange and the glycine is in yellow. But remember I told you earlier that serine and glycine are interchangeable. They, they actually convert back and forth from one to the other. So this is an important thing to understand, but where you see kind of this darker orange, these are serine, this is the role of L-serine. So we can see L-serine plays a role in pyruvate production, which is very important for energy production in the body. We need it to make ceramide, which is important for sphingolipid production and phosphatidylserine for, as a phospholipid. These play a role in nerve cell membrane function. We also need it in the methionine cycle, serine. Um, and we also need it down here. You can see serine helps us to make L-cysteine. L-cysteine is a direct precursor amino acid to GSH. This is glutathione. Uh, anytime you see that, and that plays a role as an antioxidant. So when you see that term redox, this is antioxidant function, which is how you prevent uh, an accumulation of toxins, but it's also how you protect the body from accelerated degradation and aging. We also know that through one of its mechanisms of conversion, and that is better seen over here. So if you look at, this is a very in-depth diagram, and I want to I blow it up so you can see it better. So you'll see at the center up here, L-serine makes phosphatidylserine. 
uh, which is a component of cell membranes. So how do cell membranes allow waste out of the cell and allow nutrients to come into the cell? In part, it's through phosphatidylserine's role in that lipid bilayer. If you don't have adequate phosphatidylserine, that, that can contribute to uh, an increased toxicity of cells. We know you can see serine down here in this, in this number two. I showed you earlier how it converts to glycine through um, through the use of folate. So you take folate, methylated folate, and convert uh, serine and glycine and interchange them. We, we also know if we follow it over here that serine plays a role through glycine conversions as we follow this track here to heme production. Now heme is the name of the protein found in your red blood cells heme, the structure right here is made and it's placed inside of your red blood cells and this protein is what allows you to carry oxygen. So serine plays a role in heme production through glycine, through its conversion into glycine. So it's a central role there as well. And so some people with severe enough protein malnutrition, when you don't get enough protein, you don't get enough serine or glycine, you can actually end up with anemia as more as a result of not a bit, having the ability to produce heme adequately. Now, you've all heard me talk about B vitamin deficiencies contributing to anemias like folate and vitamin B12, et cetera, but these amino acids also play a role in that heme production as, well. again, one of the functions of serine. And then if we look here, you see um, in the methylation cycle or methionine cycle, part of serine's job is to help derive methylated folate. And through that, it allows the body to metabolize homocysteine. So if you've heard me talk about this one too, homocysteine is a toxic byproduct. And when it builds up in the body, contributes to bone loss and muscle damage and heart attacks and strokes. It can also increase the risk for certain types of vascular inflammation. And with that, um, you need serine in this process. So serine plays a role in the meth methylation cycle, plays a role in cell membrane fluidity. Serine plays a role in heme synthesis. And serine plays a role in the conversion of, um, of homocysteine into cysteine. So the arrow is not there, but we look here, draw a big line to over here, and then subsequently to glutathione. And so this is one of the reasons why serine is so important. Look at all these different central functions that it plays from Detox, this whole pathway is about detoxification. This is about energy production. This is about cell membrane fluidity, getting toxins in and out of the cell, getting nutrients in and out of the cell. None of these things would be possible without adequate serine. So serine, very, very important overall in its functionality for your body.